our Father and our God, we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thrilled with the realization that the God of all eternity is our God and that our God is a loving Heavenly Father. Lord, as we open your word, we just ask that the Holy Spirit would filter out that which comes from human reasoning, human logic, and just open our eyes to the marvelous truth of your word as we begin this new study in Titus. Allow us to see the wonders of your grace, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com, and uh, today is, uh, I believe, April the 4th, 2020, and so we begin our study through Titus, verse by verse. Now, I recognize that there, there is some merit to in, in our understanding a bit of the background of these uh, pastoral epistles. However, there's also uh, some danger in emphasizing too much the authorship of Paul, uh, where, whereby we, we then diminish the authorship of the Holy Spirit. And as I've pointed out in previous studies of, of different epistles, uh, verse by verse, the author is the Holy Spirit not Paul. We're not looking at Paul's reasoning, Paul's logic, uh, or anything else. But the author is God himself. This, this book is God-breathed. So we're looking at the Holy Spirit speaking to us. Of course, Paul, uh, as any author, uh, the human author, they had their experiences but it's, it is, I want to emphasize so heavily the fact that it, it, we're looking at the Word of God and not Paul. And I believe it's important to, to, to pr present that right here just at the outset. So, surely there's a message here, you know, for us who know and love the Lord whether or not we understand much of the historical background or, or not. So this is a letter that the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write to one named Titus. Some believe that his name was Titus Silvanus, which makes him the Silas of the book of Acts. I don't think there's any evidence to support that, but some have suggested that. The Holy Spirit has led the Apostle Paul to write to Titus, who's, who's serving the Lord on an island of Crete. Uh, it's an island that's east of Sicily. It's about halfway between Sicily and the western shore of the land of Palestine. When I was a young sailor in the U.S. Navy in 1976, my ship anchored off Crete and we were given liberty. And I wandered among the ruins of... Uh, many of the, the, the earliest churches at that time, but I, I, I do recall that I, I had wandered around the ruins of the church uh, that Titus was given to shepherd over. So I stood on the very ground where Paul's letter to Titus was read. And now here I am, 44 years later, uh, getting ready to teach Titus verse by verse. I also want to say at the outset that it seems no matter what epistle that we turn to, what book that we go through verse by verse, uh, it always begins with God the Holy Spirit wanting us to know first and foremost before anything else who we are in Christ. I'm talking, we're talking about our, our identity, which is supremely important. I think more believers would see this if they didn't approach God's Word with with somewhat of a, a legal mindset or that they tend to skip past all of that, that, that hard-to-understand theological 
uh, terminology, you know, with a single goal in mind, which is to simply get to the important part, or what they think is the important part, which is, you know, being what, what they must do for God. Verse 1. Verse 1, as Paul was, we are a slave of God. Doulos is the word. Doulos is always used of a human slave in the Bible. You know, one who does what his master tells him. And we, like Paul, are a doulos of God. Yet, yet somehow the human mind thinks that, that God's slaves... As, as new creations in Christ, that, that we can choose whether or not, you know, to, to be His slave. Or we can choose whether or not to do what our Master commands us to do when what God commands, He fulfills. It always comes to pass. But we have to, we have to listen and we have, we have to know His Word and listen to His Word. If there's any resistance, any, any resistance at all to what God commands, it stems from the old man, not the new. The old man will never listen to God. We have to realize God never commands the flesh to do anything, folks. Okay? He, in fact, He has nothing to do with the flesh. He's not trying to clean up the flesh. To be a a slave of God, a doulos of God, is an amazing truth concerning the believer in Christ. Paul had belonged to God from eternity past. God had a definite purpose in the life of Paul, just as he does in your life, in that he trained Paul. He, he fitted him for the work that he did, just in the same way God fits us for the work that he's determined that we do, and, and that's whether you realize that that's occurring in your life or not. I believe it's important to realize that as we move forward into this epistle, into this verse, that there wasn't an experience in the life of Paul that was out of God's control. And surely, surely it must be apparent to every single one of you out there that that if there is one aspect, just one aspect of creation that's not controlled by God, then there's an area of doubt. I mean, is there something stronger than God? Something greater than God? Something over which God is not able to exercise control? Every aspect of Paul's life was in his hands, and he was a chosen vessel. God had prepared him for that job. It's not the genius of Paul that we're studying here. It's the Word of God. In breathed by the Holy Spirit. Paul is a servant of God. I don't know what your translation says. I'm reading from the authorized version. The word translated servant. That's, that's, well, that's a perfectly good translation. But the Greek word is doulos. It is the strongest Greek word that we have for slavery. Now, there, there's several other words that could, be, that could be used to distinguish a slave, but one born into slavery was called a doulos. Folks, born, one who was born into slavery was called a doulos. So there is, in this very construction, a testimony to the great grace of God and His elective sovereignty. Paul was born into slavery to God. Now, I'm sure it wouldn't have looked that way if, if somebody had examined his early life. In fact, we find that, that we know that he persecuted the church of God and he wasted it until God had revealed Himself. And yet, here's the testimony of the Holy Spirit that he was born into slavery. But Steve, you know, wouldn't it have happened on the road uh, to Damascus? Absolutely not. You were born as God's slave. The problem with God's elective decrees 
in, in the minds of most Christians is that somehow they picture the human race out there and God's now choosing up sides. You know, and he, he takes this one and that one and somebody else like 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 you would like someone would pick a team, you know, in sports, you know. And people rebel against such an idea of election. And I don't believe that such an idea exists in the Word of God. Over and over again, coupled with God's elective decree is always the modifying statement that it was before time began or that it was in times eternal. We see in the Gospel of Matthew that every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. And so his choice goes clear back to the planting. It was he who chose the seed that he planted. He got exactly what he expected to, to get. When he planted you, he wasn't surprised in you. He wasn't disappointed in you. God sowed and God reaped what he sowed. Paul was born a slave of God. The first place that the word, the very first place that the word doulos occurs in the Greek New Testament is is a most interesting occurrence. John 4, 51. It's a, the, we see it in the case of the rich man, you know, the the nobleman who comes to the Lord and he says, I have a son who's sick, and I want you to heal my son. Go, says Jesus, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and he went away. And while he was still on the way, his servants, Dulos, met him with the news that his boy was alive. I believe there's a purpose in the Holy Spirit pointing out to us that that's what happens in our lives. God says, do it and you do it. Many times the doing isn't the way that you would have anticipated doing it. It doesn't have all the glory and all the fanfare that you might like associated with it. And in fact, sometimes the doing looks as though it might be undoing, but it staggers my imagination that people would suggest that a man could have a, a human slave and say to him, do and he does it, and that God would have a slave and say, do and he doesn't do it. And that would make the human uh, master greater than my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Called to be an apostle, one who is sent. It says he's not only born into slavery to God, but he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. That he has one important message, and the Word is, is stressing the message that he carries more than the messenger that carries it. Is there a purpose in the Holy Spirit having this presented in the very first verse? Isn't the purpose, isn't, isn't the ultimate purpose that we'll see before we're through with these first couple of verses, that the Holy Spirit wants Titus and you and me as we study this passage of Scripture to realize that this is the truth of God's Word. It's what Titus ought to know. It's what we ought to know. born into slavery and carrying a message, a message of Jesus Christ. Now I want you to notice the close coupling of, of God and Jesus Christ in the first line or two. In the, in the third verse, uh, and, and I don't mean to jump ahead, but in verse 3, your Bible should end with something like God our Savior. Well, who's our Savior? Jesus Christ. And once again, we have that intimate connection between God, our Savior, and Jesus Christ, our Savior. In fact, your Bibles ought to say, Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. According to the faith of God's elect. Elect of God and knowledge of truth. That word knowledge is epigonosco, full experiential knowledge, according to godliness. Wow. Well, that's interesting. Since much of modern uh, Christianity today believes that, uh, you know, you know that such grace leads to license. <laughs> 
according to the faith of God's elect in the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness. It's important that these, these Gentiles on the island of Crete realize that this is the truth of God's Word and that there is power in God's Word as it relates to their lives. The truth leads to godliness. Oh, Steve, if I just preach to every, what you're preaching, my, all my congregation, they just go out and live however they want. Our text is, is dispelling that notion right here. Never was there a verse, at least in my opinion, folks, that dispelled that notion. The truth leads to godliness, not human works. You know, we read this book and it seems as though that we're untouched or, or unwilling to receive it as the Word of God. I think the Holy Spirit is asking us to give due consideration to the truth of what's being said. You know, a little bit differently than, you know, say an Arminian would translate it. And knowledge of truth, epigonosco, full experiential knowledge according to godliness. The purpose of the message that he carries, which is which is con contained succinctly in this epistle, is to bring God's elect to faith and to a full experiential knowledge of the truth that would lead to a spirit of godliness. That's the thing, folks, that will condition your life. And, and that is so difficult for people to understand. You know, if, if instilling God's people with fear is, is, is required to motivate them to serve a loving Heavenly Father, they, they have stepped totally out of the realm of love, uh, of fellowship, of redemption by grace. You violate God's grace. It is love that motivates you, not law. It's the love of God that should motivate you to do anything that you do. no matter what it is, that, that should motivate you to, to the study of His Word or to serve others. Verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before the world began. Promised before the world began. Wow. That kind of set me back on my heels a little bit. Hope, as in, that is, not wishful thinking, guaranteed expectation. Anytime you see hope in, in Scripture, it's guaranteed expectation. Promised before the world began. God's Word leads us into the truth of eternal life. But eternal life is not just some future concept, folks. It isn't just a, a deliverance from, you know, taxes, broken bones, and snake bites. It carries with it all of the grand concept of fellowship and communion with the Almighty God who spoke the worlds into existence. Now, we have eternal life now, it's not something we're going to have someday. Carried in this verse is a concept, a concept so immense that translators have stumbled over each other to get away from it. In the hope of eternal life. And that's the ultimate hope. that redeemed by grace, we face eternal fellowship and communion with the Savior. I understand this, okay? It's, it's future as well. You know, imagine fellowshipping with Christ and never, ever, ever again sinning against Him. I'm not making light of the, of the future concept of eternal life, but folks, we have eternal life now, okay? Because we are in the One who's eternal. 
which God promised before, before the world began. Well, how did he do that? We weren't around then. Well, since we weren't around at that time, I have to see this as a promise made to Christ by the Father, made to Christ. Our representative, our head, we read in 2 Timothy 1.1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy 1.9, he has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not because of our own works, but by His own purpose and by the grace He granted us in Christ Jesus before time eternal. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that He should lie, neither the Son of Man that He should repent. Hath He said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Some have suggested that, uh, well, what it's saying is, it's, it's saying that God promised this through the prophets. I believe in this verse that we have a tiny glimpse into the eternal counsels of the Almighty God. This hope of eternal life is in the truth of the Word of God, which is eternal. The reason He placed the stars in their orbits, the sun, the moon, the reason He created man, all the rest of creation, all the purposes behind the experiences that are recorded in the Old Testament, all of this was in the counsel and the de decree of God before He spoke the worlds into existence. And in that council, and in, in, in that decree, your name appeared. That's right. Your name appeared. God's elect, folks, can't just be some nondescript group. You know, the, the easiest way to get out of any problem with God's sovereignty and majesty is by suggesting that you become one of God's elect when you accept Christ and all that does is totally destroy the concept of God's elect. In fact, it totally destroys the concept of grace itself. The word election means to be called out. God's called out ones. But Steve, now wait a minute. God, God does know. He knows who those will be. So until we accept Christ, or if we accept Christ, then we become one of His called out ones. But folks, that destroys all of the fabric, all of the power, all of, all of the immensity of God's sovereign decree. I believe in the second verse. The Holy Spirit is asking you to realize that you were in the counsels of God before He ever spoke the words that, that, he, that he did that, that spoke you know, that brought everything into existence. Let there be light. Before He ever spoke the worlds into existence. And that's the purpose of the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In His suffering in your place, His dying in your place, a substitutionary death. It includes the concept of an eternal fellowship and communion with a loving Heavenly Father. All that Christ accomplished on the cross is, is not consummated in the fact that you simply are, are now a Christian, but that through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, you in your redemption face an eternal fellowship and communion with God, God Almighty. If coming to faith in an experiential full knowledge of the truth, there isn't the concept of an, of an eternal fellowship with God beginning now, there's something lacking, something vastly wrong with the preaching of that gospel. It is not just about going to heaven someday, folks. <laughs> 
you know, like, you know, we accepted Christ, therefore, you know, so we're good. We're, we're going to heaven. Therefore, that's all that really matters. And I don't care about reward. I don't care about any of the rest of that. I just walked the aisle, shook the preacher's hand, accepted Christ into my heart. I don't know, that was so many years ago. It's a done deal. It's like signing a contract with Verizon. You know? Honestly, folks, do you, do you, do you think that that's how... I'm at a little loss for words when I hear people talk in those terms. Eternal life, it doesn't just mean to live forever. It's not, people tend to think of, of eternal life in the, in the, in the concept of, of time, whereas it's, eternity is merely just an extension of time. Folks, it's contained in that word is, is it's the quality of life, okay? The quality, not the quantity, the quality of life. And it, it embodies all of that fellowship, that communion, that sweetness, you know, of a God of grace, a God of love who can't do enough for us. And we know that it hasn't entered into the mind of man the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. Constant, unbroken fellowship. It's not going to be an occasional uh, encounter with Christ, you know, in heaven, like, you know, you know, like, you know, there He is off, far off in the distance, and, you know, we can, maybe if we have a pair of binoculars, we can see Him, you know, or something. Like, like we see Him every now and then, He just kind of comes passing by. Maybe stops for a moment, talks to us, and then we go on to talk to Paul or Peter or James. It's not going to be like that at all. A constant fellowship. Promise to Christ who promised this to us by a God who cannot lie. So if, if you came here expecting to hear me to task you with something that you got to do to ensure all of this truth belongs to you, well, I'm, I'm, well, I'm glad to disappoint you. Folks, we are God's slave, a slave to righteousness in the new man, elect, chosen by God, with a particular faith resulting in an experiential knowledge of truth that leads to godliness with a guaranteed expectation of eternal life, all based on what? On something you did? No all based on a promise made to Jesus Christ by the Father before the worlds ever came into existence. A, a holy calling, not because of our own works, but by His own purpose and by the grace granted us in Christ Jesus before time in, in, in an in, entirely different realm called eternity, distinct from what we, we know as time. And this by a God who can't lie. Absolutely amazing. And all of this, folks, in just the first two verses. Just the first two verses. We hadn't even got started yet. How is it that so many Christians can look at, at the study of His Word as being boring and dry and Look, folks, I love you all. I truly do, and I hope you're all well. Every one of you are well and staying well. We'll make it through this because God is in control. I appreciate all of your comments, all of your, all of your questions, all of your comments, all of your love, your prayers, your support. And until next time, rest in Him. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.